I hope you picked up a program agenda because we have a special speaker that's going to join us uh, uh, for a few remarks before we move into our afternoon breakout sessions. Um, and I know I want to talk a little bit about, you know, you all have boundless passion and commitment. And with that, with our most valuable resource, though, that we have is each other. You know, I talked earlier this morning about collaboration because we know that without collaboration, our growth is limited to our own perspectives. And much unlike what we see in national politics and many other industries in the climate economy, successful clean energy entrepreneurs know that partnership is leadership. And the ability to collaborate effectively to quickly propagate a good idea is the most important competitive advantage we have as a community, particularly the way we do things here in Vermont. Um, so we build renewable power not for ourselves, but for the people we serve. Strong service-focused partnerships are fundamental to our culture here and to our success. The growth of renewable energy provides tremendous opportunity uh, to address some of the greatest challenges faced by less financially fortunate neighbors. The high cost and energy burden of housing, travel, and unemployment. You may not know that approximately 20% of Vermont households qualify as low income. Uh, that's an, an estimated 125,000 Vermonters that uh, remain in fuel poverty. We can resolve this and lift them up and out of a vicious cycle of need uh, with renewable energy by providing long-term financial relief to families struggling with high and, and unpredictable fuel costs. Renewable energy, as you all know, provides living wage employment opportunities and local energy security. However, there remains a real need for policies and initiatives that effectively overcome the unique barriers faced by our low, moderate, and fixed income neighbors in order to ensure that our transition to 100% renewables is beneficially transformative for our health, our planet, and all of our communities and all of our neighbors. We have an extraordinary opportunity to work together to, as a community of leaders, pioneers, to learn from what's working, what's not, share, each other, share with each other, make real progress on our shared values and commitments, and do so effectively and efficiency, efficiently. Focusing on our theme, Renewables for All, Rev is grateful for the opportunity to learn from a leading practitioner with you. Um, so I'm going to introduce Jason Edens, who is the founder and director of the Rural Renewable Energy Alliance, a nonprofit organization dedicated to fighting energy poverty with solar power and ensuring that solar energy is accessible to all. As a thought leader on issues of energy and equity, Jason and his team have installed hundreds of low-income solar installations throughout the country and abroad, forging an inclusive clean energy future. Jason's a licensed building contractor and lives in an off-grid solar powered home and in, in, in northern Minnesota from which he has traveled all the way from to join us here today. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Jason who uh, is going to share some of his thoughts and success on how we can help our neighbors with energy poverty with renewable energy. Good afternoon friends. Uh, again my name is Jason Edens and I work for an organization called REAL or the Renewable Energy Alliance as Olivia mentioned. Uh, we are a nonprofit general and electrical contractor and my main message that I'd like to share with you all today is that in addition to the climate benefits, the economic benefits, the environmental benefits, I also want to share that solar is a very powerful tool in the fight against poverty. So as a nonprofit general and electrical contractor, we have been delivering solar solutions to our low income communities since our inception in 2000. So although we're all very fond of the economic advantages, the business development advantages, the workforce advantages, please bear in mind that we also have an opportunity to leverage solar in the fight against poverty. So this time of year, Vermonters, Minnesotans, citizens from all across the United States have to make some very difficult choices. Vermonters are facing very difficult choices. And I suspect that some of you right now are saying to yourself, 
I know, I have to choose, should I ski at Sugarbush or Jay Peak? That's actually not the choice I'm referring to. I'm referring to the choice between paying the health care bill or the heating bill. I'm referring to the choice between paying the house payment or the energy bill. When families have to choose between home energy and other basic needs, families are living in what we call energy poverty. And energy poverty actually affects one in eight of us, one in eight Americans. That's approximately 40 million Americans who have to face these choices each and every year. And quite frankly, in the most severe cases, energy poverty literally presents the impossible choice of heating or eating. And these are not simply statistics. I'd like to put a face to heating or eating. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the saga at Standing Rock. As billions of dollars of commodities are flowing beneath that community, there's endemic energy poverty. And band members have frozen to death. So energy poverty is a real issue. It's barely on the societal radar. But once again, it affects one in eight of our neighbors, our friends, our family members. So I want you all just to imagine for a moment a loved one having to choose between heating and eating. This is the reality in our country. Now fortunately for families that are struggling or wrestling or grappling with energy poverty, there is a federal program, a social safety net that is absolutely critical. And it's one that I personally depended on for many, many years growing up. It's called energy assistance. Perhaps you've heard of it as fuel assistance or heating assistance. Technically, it's the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. And it's present in 96% of the counties in the United States. Literally from Point Barrow, Alaska to Key West, from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon. And the way in which this necessary safety net works is this. A low-income family that's income eligible that can't pay its heating bills, like I couldn't when I was young, can turn to this program and literally have energy bills, be they heating or cooling, paid for through this necessary program. In Vermont, we spend about $20 million a year. In my home state of Minnesota, it's about $120 million a year. In your neighbor, New York, it's about $320 million per year. Nationally, it's about a three to five billion dollar price tag to put a Band-Aid on a wound that needs more serious attention. We are literally hemorrhaging public resources without providing a long-term solution, without empowering low-income families, and without addressing the root causes of energy assistance, of energy poverty. So although energy assistance is a necessary social safety net, I would like to ask you, if there's a better way. Is there a way in which we can address low-income energy poverty? Is there a better way? I think that right now we need to ask ourselves, is energy assistance providing a solution or is it postponing a solution? And I'm not being disparaging of the program because I personally have benefited from it. Many of my neighbors have benefited from it. But again, a stopgap is not a solution. Solar energy is the future of energy assistance. By integrating solar energy into the federal energy assistance program, we can provide both a fiscally responsible and environmentally appropriate solution to low-income energy poverty. Rather than paying low-income families energy bills year after year unabated, we can provide a long-term solution that provides energy security for our low-income communities for decades. This is not a Democratic idea, it's not a Republican idea, Green Party, Libertarian idea. It's simply a good policy idea. By integrating solar into energy assistance, we can forge a new model of energy assistance that offers a return to the taxpayer and literally provides energy security for low-income families for decades. Community solar for community action. Now, many of you might not be familiar with the Community Action Agency Network or even energy assistance. If you haven't benefited from it, if you haven't worked at an agency that provides this service, you might not be familiar with this necessary social safety net. But all across this country, there are a thousand community action agencies which, at the local level, are delivering energy assistance and weatherization. And the reason I point out weatherization is because we all know that energy efficiency is a much better investment on the front end. 
So by working with community action agencies, we can ensure that our low-income neighbors' homes and housing stock is energy efficient, and then we can deliver energy to our low-income neighbors through community solar. If every one of these 1,000 agencies had a community solar array that they could depend on, they could deliver energy assistance locally for decades. When we started this model in 2000, people said, you're crazy. And we said, what does that have to do with delivering solar to low-income families? Today, as you all know, and as you're helping create, there's a national conversation about low-income solar. And what I would like to point out is that although it's very exciting to see this discourse, this dialogue grow to the national level, we need to be cautious about creating a crazy quilt of low-income solar models. From an efficiency and effectiveness perspective, let's leverage the National Energy Assistance Program, which started during the LBJ administration in 1965 and again serves the entire country. If we can integrate solar into this federal service, we can rapidly and broadly scale low-income solar through an existing national network. LIHEAP is the common denominator for low-income social services. Whether you're doing affordable housing in LA or improving the energy efficiency of mobile homes in Maine, LIHEAP is the common denominator. And if we can deliver community solar to the agencies that provide those services, we can rapidly create a national low-income solar program. So again, energy assistance, it has been described by the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, as a fossil fuel subsidy. There is simply no return. Although there are incredible social benefits to energy assistance, we are making a massive investment on behalf of our low-income communities that, quite frankly, has no financial return. So it really begs the question, do we want conventional fossil fuel assistance or do we want solar assistance, a long-term, fiscally responsible, and environmentally appropriate solution to low-income energy poverty? Solar is a very powerful tool in the fight against poverty, and if we are actually committed to making a transition to a clean economy, 90 by 50, we have to ensure that we're intentionally creating mechanisms to have an inclusive clean energy future where our low-income neighbors, friends, and family members have equal access to the benefits of solar energy. Thank you very much.